Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, good to be back. Uh, and uh, great to hear that Guy referred to every one of you as a teacher this morning, and indeed a learner. To answer your question, it absolutely can change, and it must change. We're very clear that education is a key, essential driver in where we need to go in this Harmony agenda. Um, but it will happen because we align the measure that all of you know about in education. Everything is measured. Data is at the forefront of education. But we know that when we align measure to meaning, the learning is even better. And the reason it's even better is because it gives young people purpose in what they do. They're motivated to learn. Uh, we will have some examples of that tomorrow uh, in the workshop session. Uh, so it absolutely has to be a joined up approach. I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more right now, Patrick. I've been a head teacher for many years and my school now is a 500 pupil state primary school. I wanted to see what was possible in the mainstream system to create fundamental change in education. If we want this harmony message to be lived out, we do need an education revolution. We need everything to be shifted to a different place. Harmony, I'm afraid the slide doesn't fully show it, but harmony is an active but balanced state applicable to the natural world and human society. So we know that when a community works well, it's because it's harmonious. The relationships work uh, and it's a cohesive, joined up system. Three weeks ago, uh, Patrick and I had a busy day clearing out his pond. We were pulling out all the weed so that it was nice and clear for potentially some of you tomorrow night at the party to have a swim. As we sat looking out over this glorious scene on a beautiful summer's afternoon, uh, Patrick said to me, look at that grass. That is happy grass. I did just check how much wine he'd had, but of course... He was telling the truth, because the grass was happy, the soil was healthy, and the ecosystem was incredibly abundant. It was a scene of health and well-being. We absolutely need to do that now with education. And we've become, I think, very narrow in our education system right now. We know when children are happy in their learning, it's because their learning is healthy. It means something to them. They have a role to play. It is not dominated by teacher-led learning. It's an empowering process where they become the leaders of their learning. Of course, there's a need to teach and to deliver core skills and knowledge. But ultimately, it's about what they take from that and how they deliver it. If I give you one simple example, our children in, in my school in year two learn about bees. We've heard already this morning from Tony Juniper about the crisis in some parts of the world where the bee population has gone. And if children learn about bees, they understand how brilliantly bees are part of a joined up system. These children are only seven years old, but they are experts in bees. They're experts in bee biodiversity, the different roles they play, uh, and they're experts in how bees interrelate with an interdependent system, pollinating and sustaining that system. Of course, the outcome of that is the beautiful honey that we enjoy, and local honey, as you all know, makes us well. What a powerful message that is for children. But I'd like to focus specifically today, because the conference is obviously on food and farming, on this question of food and children and food. Since the beginning of this year, I've been very involved with Patrick and the Sustainable Food Trust and the wonderful Professor Cadman on exploring how we take out these principles of harmony into education. And food is a brilliant way in which to do that. I, I'm very struck by this little girl, Zoe, and the way she is cradling that courgette as if it's a baby. The prince left us with a message of a baby, and it feels like she's really nurturing something with that courgette. But we know that the evidence tells us that when children eat really healthy food, 
they learn better, they concentrate better, they thrive. So we absolutely must put food at the heart of all that they learn. Our journey started a few years ago, and uh, our gardener, I don't even know if he's here. Daryl, are you here? Uh, he is on the left of this photo. He was instrumental in introducing food growing into our school, and remarkably, his son left my school to come to this school. Of all the schools in the country, he's come here, and he's just been appointed at the gardener of this school, as well as mine. We've got a bit of working out to do on the hours there. Um, but the employing of a gardener in a school is an amazing thing to do. Uh, any of you linked to schools, find ways to fund a gardener because it transforms the way our children understand the world. So when our children started to grow organic, healthy produce and to see that journey from seed to crop and then to harvest it and to share it in the school, it's a very powerful experiential message. What we've done in my school is to grow more and more. I know that's not always possible in some schools, but if we link into local farmers, local allotment growers, there is huge potential for us to localize food growing and be outward facing, linking into our communities. So the harvest of that produce goes into the kitchen uh, and the children can see direct impact in terms of what they grow and what they eat. Alongside the local seasonal organic produce we were growing, we wanted to challenge our kitchen to change what they do. So the first thing we did was to challenge them to, to make one shift. I think it's a message for all of us, isn't it, in this conference. What's the first thing we're going to do when we leave this conference? To change something for the better to become more aligned to principles of harmony. So we introduced organic milk and our catering contractor then agreed to position that across all 300 schools within weeks. The next thing we did was to shift to organic meat. And we said, if we're going to have organic meat, we probably need less of it. So let's have less meat, but better quality, and we'll have vegetarian options linking in. So it was creative thinking. In all this, the education world needs to develop creative thinkers. If they're just taught and they don't think for themselves, we won't get the answers that we want to see. The Soil Association has a, a fantastic scheme uh, called the Food for Life scheme. And uh, as you can see here, the caterers were gold food for life. Is Helen here today? Helen Browning? Hello, Helen. Um, so the scheme is obviously a brilliant scheme. I think my challenge right now is how we can increase the, the percentage of organic and free range at a gold level or even to introduce a platinum level or something like that to, uh, to challenge schools and other organizations to go to 50% or more. Maybe a conversation we can have later on. So incentivizing the shift is really key. The reward scheme of Food for Life is a brilliant one uh, and something that we, I'm sure, can work together on in building. But we wanted to make a big shift to organic fruit and veg. And as you know, that's not cheap. It's not an easy thing to do. These are apricots from our apricot tree that were harvested yesterday and are going to be shared during this conference today. So what we did was we looked at using less fruit and veg. So here, strawberry jelly with strawberries on top rather than just a bowl of strawberries. So we used less ingredient but we wanted to stick with the quality of the organic produce. The whole way through this, our starting point was healthy food, as far as possible organic food and local food, so that's what we kept coming back to. And now we're showcasing this. We're sharing this with other schools, we're showing them what's possible, and we're blurring the line between what we do in our lunch times with our kitchen and what we do with our classrooms with our children. I think education can be, we've heard already, very compartmentalized, departmentalized. What it needs to do is to become joined up, cohesive, to make sense for our children. And the kitchen in a school has a huge role to play with that. Last year, the prince came to the school and he challenged us to go to 100% organic with our food. We are now, as you can see there, 90%. We have one or two last ingredients 
that we're trying to work on. There is a cost. We've heard about the true cost of food. We asked our parents if they would pay 10p more a day, 50p a week, six pounds a term, 18, 20 pounds a year. It is nothing. And they agreed. But in addition to that, that didn't meet the full cost. And our catering contractor said, we are so inspired by the vision of this work that we will find a way as a non, not-for-profit, we'll find a way to make this work because we believe totally in this message. Final point on the food. We measure our food waste every day. Year four, nine-year-olds measure the food waste. They analyze what we're throwing away with the aim of reducing it. It's part of the circular economy at eight and nine years old. And then all that food waste in school is recycled back onto the growing beds uh, year on year. This was taken just three days ago. Smelly compost. So in all this process, we come back to healthy food, uh, healthy soil, and this food growing well. The voice of our children, we've heard from Dame Ellen already, is really powerful in this. These children have given their views on what organic food and farming means to them. They're becoming very discerning. They're influencing their parents and their wider community on what they believe needs to happen. It's fascinating to see the language that they start articulating around these messages. So a final couple of points. The Prince has talked to us today about geometry, this proportion and patterning of the world. Some of you may know this image. It is the orbit of Earth and Venus round the sun. It creates a five-petaled flower. It's eight Earth years, 13 Venus years. Fibonacci spiral has these numbers in its sequence. This is in the orbiting around the solar system. It is exactly the same form, as you will know, of a five petaled flower. That is truly remarkable. And when our children learn, as they do in my school, week on week, about the geometry and the patterning of nature, they really understand their world in a different way. Alongside that, this sense of being, sorry, that's just an image of them recreating that geometry. This sense of being is essential, isn't it? We had our beautiful moment of silence today, and when our children know how to be, how to find their peace, how to connect to the wholeness and the oneness of the world and the universe of God, they understand something very powerful. There's a lovely poem written by the American poet Drew Dellinger, and he starts, it's 3.23 in the morning, and I'm awake because my great-great-grandchildren won't let me sleep. My great-great-grandchildren come to me in dreams and they ask me, what did you do when the planet was plundered? What did you do when the earth was unraveling? What did you do once you knew? We know enough. We know what needs to be done. And this conference is a defining moment for us to change for the better the way that we work and live the way that we are. Thank you.